the start for the presentation that uh, Moira is going to share with us. So you'll have, um, uh, you'll be looking at that screen while we jump into uh, first our happy thoughts. And I know at this point that um, uh, Peter was going to share something with us. So uh, Peter, would, would you mind uh, jumping in now? Sure, thanks, Brett. I uh, just wanted to let people know what's happening with the Pay 10 project. Uh, it hasn't been submitted yet. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we have uh, three clubs in Alberta that are applying for $5,000 each from their district. And that, uh, that decision will be made in early April. So as soon as that decision is made, um, and hopefully we'll have all the MOUs signed by the various participating organizations in Guatemala and, and all the documents from all the schools that are participating in the first year. And then we'll submit uh, the, um, uh, the, the application and hopefully it'll be approved by, by the end of June before the rules and regulations for global grants change within Rotary. Um, also tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. there is a uh, committee meeting uh, where the where Lusani Contreras, who is the uh, the woman doing all the work uh, in Guatemala to prepare for this project, uh, will be giving an update. So if anybody's interested in participating in that, let me know and I'll send them the Zoom information. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, so if anybody else has a happy thought, we do. Um, I can't see everybody's uh, face on the screen just now, but uh, let us know and we'll try to uh, get to you. I have one, Brett. It's Allison. Please, Allison. Yes. Um, I saw in the uh, Chatham Daily News online, Barry talking about the eco trail. I'm not sure if you've already discussed that or not, but there was a good article about um, <coughs> all of the use of the Rotary Eco Trail and the group that was involved with getting it all up and running. It was, I guess it was like 10 years ago, Barry, and yes, how happy is. everybody is with the results. So kudos, Barry, and happy birthday. Congrats. That's double, double whammy. <laughs> double good news for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Allison. It was a good group that was pulled together on Saturday. We have to uh, uh, take our hats off to uh, to the community members that uh, what I would call the friends of Paxson's Bush uh, that were involved in that some 10 plus years ago now. Uh, but we, when we were out there on, on, uh, on Saturday, there was a certain lot of people uh, walking the trail. Good news uh, that they were able to find uh, the great horned owl. Yeah, there are actually, I think there's four in there and they have put up the um, um, nesting box again to see whether they'll go to that as opposed to the tree. Somebody said another tree went over, but I don't think it was which tree that was, so. Uh, I have a question with respect to uh, our, our trail. Uh, I'm, I walk through it two, two to three times a week and it strikes me that more and more and more of the trees are being cut down and dying. And I'm wondering whether or not uh, there's any plan to replant to make sure that it doesn't become sometime the Rotary Desert Trail. <laughs> yeah, um, we are hoping to um, uh, have the municipality join us for a bit of a walkthrough, Tom. Um, probably in, uh, well, I was thinking April, but actually it might happen sooner than that. Uh, I agree. I, I, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, just the wind that came up uh, like a week ago, Monday. I think yes. there were about three trees that went down with that. So there are a significant number of um, trees that are going down. They're doing a great job keeping the trail nice and clear. But uh, yeah, new growth. I'm a, I'm a little anxious about that. So we'll check with the municipality and uh, see, because um, if we can get our hands on some trees, it'd be a, it's a great spot to try and put some in. I'm not sure what kind of regulations uh, we have to deal with for that. But, uh, and I mean, it changes entirely as soon as spring comes and everything starts popping out. Oh, for so, sure. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, uh, but I, I agree with you. I don't want to see the Rotary Desert Trail there. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you also, uh, Tom. And I noticed that when Carol and I were out there on Saturday, uh, we don't walk as often as you guys do. Uh, but there, I suspect that there's a plan of some sort. We need to know what the plan is so that it doesn't become the desert trail. So I, I know that uh, Genevieve uh, Champagne is quite willing to walk around uh, with us at any time in the next uh, shorter while. And so we can hear more about what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I have a short, short, happy note. As of uh, last Friday, I became one of the people who's received the vaccination. Woohoo! Excellent. You don't look any better. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, Barry. You, you can dish it out too. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one that got it last Friday. <laughs> ah, good, good for you, Andy. Great, that's good. Okay. Um, any other happy notes before I move on? So last night we had a um, situation at Bingo where we had to announce somebody's birthday, uh, which we did, uh, Mr. Fraser. And I, I was advised that they were wondering whether he was now available to get the shot yet or not. <laughs> oh, oh. That I was want, not me. I want, I want you to know I have to wait for two more slots before I get become eligible. <laughs> Barry, just, just a baby. Did you see, now, just in case people didn't see it today, they did announce if you were born in 1946 or earlier, as of today, you are eligible for the shot. They just announced that like an hour ago. Oh, great. Good. And now you have to call, I'll put it in the chat, but it's a, if you have a last name starting with A to J or M to Z, you have to call Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of thing. So I'll look for it and put it in the chat in this call. But yeah, as of, they just announced that like an hour ago. So 1946 well, want, or earlier, you are now eligible. I want you to know I am not eligible. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks for the clarification, Barry. You're still you, you're still infectious. <laughs> that, that's his humor. That's right. So, his, so his I know we're all picking on Barry, and we really enjoy doing that. But uh, I, I also have <laughs> to uh, say happy birthdays to uh, Donna, who was uh, a few days back, and coming up uh, next week, I think Keith Dawson. So uh, happy birthdays. We celebrate all month because we don't get together. Um, so we, we pass it along this way. And our club anniversaries were Lori Marshall. And if you go to the Chatham Kent uh, Health Alliance website, uh, you might hook up to something where you can sign in and vote for Lori for a um, um, medical champion uh, to our neighborhood. So uh, um, please do that. Also, uh, Monica Rambor and Rick Bednarik. Um, club anniversaries. So uh, Rick is celebrating 15 years. So thank you very much for all that you do for us, Rick. President Brett, with, uh, yes. I, I'd like to, uh, now that to, we're to talking about celebrations, uh, last night I sat in on a Zoom call, came out from the Rotary Club of Oakville, and uh, there were roughly 800 people on it, I suppose mostly Rotarians, and featured there was uh, incoming RI President Jennifer Jones, and uh, along with uh, re now retired uh, Beverly McLaughlin of the Supreme Court of Canada. Just an excellent presentation. I'm in the process of trying to get the recording for that and circulated amongst uh, the membership uh, here. Uh, it's without a doubt the, one of the best Zoom calls I've been on for a long time. Sorry, I'm just jotting down that information from Allison. I'll, I'll include that on uh, one of the messages that I'll be sending out shortly. Yeah. Um, okay, so at this point, our, our presentation is gonna come from uh, Moira and we keyed it up and we didn't wanna let it go, just anxious that we might do something wrong, which I feel Moira's pain in, in trying to do it. But uh, Moira, if uh, any introduction you need to do this or well, I could just read a little bit. Yeah, it, the, the program is called Nature's Best Hope. 
and the program is the work of Doug Tallamy, a professor of entomology and wildlife ecology at the University of Delaware. Dr. Tallamy discusses simple steps that each one of us can and must take to reverse declining biodiversity. And mostly he's talking about birds. This program was part of the Ontario Agricultural Conference delivered in January this year by the University of Guelph Ridgetown campus. And the program was sponsored by the Lower Thames Conservation Authority and is being shown to Chatham Rotary by special permission of the conference. And now that spring is on the way, it's a good time to plan to add local caterpillar friendly plants to the garden. Okay, well, I press run and see what happens. Yes, uh, before you do that, Moira, we'll just uh, indicate to everybody, uh, it's, it's a uh, lengthy program. If you have to go, no worries, uh, but if you can stay, I think you'll find it worthwhile. Uh, good morning. I want to talk to you today about my ideas of what nature's best hope is. Um, the statistics I use largely in this talk are from the U.S. because that's where I'm from. But what's happening in the U.S. is also happening in, in Canada. Uh, nature is a series of very specialized relationships, millions of them all woven together. Today, though, these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked at it over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem today, of course, is that we don't have the option of leaving uh, most of North America the way it was. Uh, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological state, and that's true for southern Canada as well. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly, we've killed it, we've drained it, we've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland just in the U.S., and that's four and a half times the size of Texas. We've paved it, of course, and, and otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. Uh, in short, we have carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the species that uh, run the ecosystems that we humans depend on. You know, we thought that, that Earth, our nest, was so big, we could foul it forever without consequences. But of course, we were wrong. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this at a pretty regular clip. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's one third of the North American bird population gone. And now the UN predicts that uh, we could lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years, which, by the way, is not an option. It's simply not an option. Well, I could go on about the pox that we humans have, have uh, inflicted upon the environment and thus upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. Uh, it's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but they will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? The very famous Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson from Harvard, told us what it would mean if we were to lose our insects way back in 1987 in this paper called The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, the energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems would change drastically. It would be interrupted, which would cause the collapse of the food webs that support our animals. The amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, and to a lesser extent, our freshwater fish, they would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot due to the loss of, of bacteria and, and or the insects that due to the loss of the insects that recycle nutrients very quickly. We'd only have uh, bacteria and fungi left to do that job. 
And finally, humans would, would uh, not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that um, this doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the, the services produced by healthy natural ecosystems. We call them ecosystem services. Here are some of the things that, that um, plants give us. They produce oxygen, pretty important. Clean our water and slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. Carbon capture. Plants are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, locking it up in their tissues and pumping the, the uh, extra carbon into the ground. Our soils are are brown or black because of carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Plants build topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods, dampen severe weather, and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and again, other things. So designing landscapes like this that don't produce any of those ecosystem services is simply not an option. It never was a good option, but today with 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet, it's not an option at all because we need more ecosystem services today than ever before. There were visionaries through the ages who recognized that humans needed to work on their relationship with planet Earth. Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent in the first half of the 1900s, wrote lots of things. One of the things he said was, the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been some indigenous groups that have been good at that, but our, our, our Western societies, our great Asian societies um, have been terrible. We extract more than the earth has to offer, move to another place, do it again um, in a very unsustainable way. So Allo had a dream. He dreamt that we humans would actually develop a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm it and lumber it and graze it and all those things. But he dreamt that we could learn how to do that gently without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called his land ethic in the Sand County Almanac. What he never talked about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in, in uh, the culture of Aldo Leopold's day. It's still embedded in our own. But I suspect he didn't even recognize it as an option. What I want to argue today is that living with nature not only is an option, it's the only viable option that's left to us. We now have to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Where are we going to do this? Well, one place we can not ignore are these private land homelands, private property. Uh, in the U.S., east of the Mississippi, 85.6% of the U.S. is privately owned. If we were to ignore private property, we'd only be dealing with 15% of the land, not nearly enough to have effective conservation. So what we need to do is re renew all parts of nature uh, in, in places where we've destroyed it, essentially. But not all species contribute equally to ecosystem services. So we need to, to, to rebuild ecosystems with the building blocks first, the most important species that other species depend on. And one of the first things we have to do is reestablish food webs. Remember, plants are capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food. And all the animals on, on the earth depend on that food. Well, most animals don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants, and that's something typically is insects. And it turns out most of the insects that are transferring energy from plants to other animals are caterpillars. Caterpillars are more important than that energy transfer than any other species. So if we, if we did not landscape in a way that encourages caterpillars, most of the energy would remain tied up in plants, and you would have failed food webs. Let's use chickadees as an example. This is the Carolina chickadee, the black-capped chickadees doing exactly the same thing. Um, largely seed eaters during the winter, but uh, when they're reproducing, they switch to insects because their babies cannot eat seeds. And if they're in a healthy environment, they feed those babies exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 90% of the, the birds in North America, 96% of the birds in North America rear their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. I say that because of uh, a number of sources of data, but here's a, a project that my recent graduate student, Ashley Kennedy, finished. She put out a call, a citizen science project, put out a call to photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season as they were carrying prey items back to the nest. 
She got thousands of pictures and reconstructed the nestling diet for 16 of the 20 common bird families in North America. Uh, the green bars that you're seeing here are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 bird families, caterpillars dominated the, the nestling diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we lost our caterpillars. 16 out of the 20 common bird families would not be able to reproduce. What is special about caterpillars? Several things. One is they're soft. Think of this guy as uh, a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. Uh, the thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle, it's undigestible, and the birds don't like, uh, don't want a lot of undigestible material. And because it's soft, they can stuff that prey item down the throat of their offspring without fear of injuring it. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, they're pretty rough. They take that beak and they just stuff it down there like a plunger. Um, caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're very nutritious. They're high in protein, high in fat, low percentage of chitin, uh, as I said before, particularly compared to beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Much of a beetle is undigestible, and they also have lots of sharp edges. And it turns out caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids, yet carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. So we have to get them from plants. That's why my wife, Cindy, says I have to eat my, my carrots to get my beta carotene and I have to eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. And she makes sure I eat all of those things because they stimulate my immune system and I cannot think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. They're antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. Carotenoids improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. And we're talking about things like this male prothonotary warbler. He's bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. He takes those lutines, makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. But where are the birds getting their carotenoids? From the prey items that they bring back to the nest. But carotenoid content is not equal among those prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have by far the most carotenoids, followed by orthopteroids, things like grasshoppers, kinkadidids, and crickets. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves, far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. And here's the earthworm way over here. The early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does this influence prey choice when birds are rearing their young? Well, I actually did another experiment with GoPro cameras on uh, the rooftops of bluebird houses, and she found there's a very clear relationship between the frequency with which a, a prey item is brought back. Caterpillars are brought back more often than anything else, and it's carotenoid content. So caterpillars are the best, followed by those orthopteroids, and then everybody else is nestled down here in the corner. So it does uh, suggest that uh, birds are selecting prey items based, uh, at least in part, on carotenoid content. Um, so this, this, all this together uh, does suggest that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They seem to be essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question would be, how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough? Um, well, let's go to chickadees again. Got a lot of data with chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? takes thousands. One or two is not enough. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees just to get into the point where they, where they uh, leave the nest. And then their parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 24 um, days after they, after they leave the nest. Now, if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, you need those caterpillars in your yard because they're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. They only forage about 50 meters from the nest. And if we don't landscape in a way that makes those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And when you have insect decline, there's growing evidence that that's a major factor in bird decline. We looked at the uh, original data set from Rosenberg et al., the, the study that showed that we'd lost 3 billion birds and divided birds up into two groups. The bird species that act, uh, required insects at one part of their life history, typically breeding, and the birds that do not require insects. So things like our, our um, doves and finches that can breed without 
insects. They use seeds. They actually gain some numbers, but the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This does not prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as insects decline, so do our birds. So how do we landscape in a way that makes lots of insects, lots of caterpillars? Well, we add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that support them, the plants that make those caterpillars. Seems easy enough, but there is a catch, and that is most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. Uh, and that's because caterpillars are really fussy about what they eat. You know, the monarch butterfly is only going to eat milk beads. It's not going to eat burning bush and other things that we put in our yard from, from Asia. So we have to put the plants that our, our um, insects have specialized on. And most of our insect herbivores are host plant specialists. Why is that? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it through their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a, a very effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? This is where the specialization comes in. Um, all plant lineages are, are protecting themselves with different cocktails of chemical defenses. So um, insects can't uh, adapt to all of those types of defenses. So they pick one or two plant lineages and they get good at getting around just those. They develop the enzymes and the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. But it locks them into eating just those plants. Then they can't switch off to something else for which they have not developed adaptations. And all of those adaptations take a long period of evolutionary history to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. All I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild landscapes that support a lot of life, we've got to put the plants in those landscapes that actually do that. I'm going to give you three examples of how well this works, starting with our property here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. We have 10 acres from an old farm uh, that was... Uh, it was farmed for 300 years, so in the late 1600s, exhausted soil, uh, and it was mowed for hay before we, we moved in. I'm actually sitting in this window right here. Um, well, uh, when it was taken out of, of uh, mowing before we moved in, it, um, what really they were mowing were all the invasive uh, species from Asia, Oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and the, you know, the scapies from our garden. That's what our property really looked like. Here's my wife getting ready to, to get rid of all that stuff. As she did that, I was putting in the plants that would bring that life back. Uh, and this is when I started with early on. I wanted to attract the Canadian outlet. I'd never seen one, uh, but Canadian outlets, uh, that's what the adult looks like, are specialists on meadow rue. We didn't have any meadow rue. So I planted meadow rue, grew nicely. Uh, and, you know, I didn't know if the, the Canadian outlets would ever find our little patch of meadow rue, but they did. They found it right away. And there you go. I have added two species of, of uh you know, one species of plant, one insect to our property. Same thing with the goldenrod stowaway. I wanted this moth uh, because it's pretty. Um, has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's actually a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. Uh, there were Biden seeds uh, in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some, planted them. Took about a year for the moth to find it, but they did. And now we got a good population of uh, both Biden's and the goldenrod stowaway. So we've added four species to the property. I wanted the hackberry emperor. It's a butterfly that should be here. It's what it looks like, but it depends on hackberry. And we didn't have any hackberry. I put in hackberry. The butterflies found it in about four years. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own, but along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, goldenrod gall moth. Now, this is what I'm still waiting for, the goldenrod flower moth. And that's what its larva looks like. I don't know why they haven't found our goldenrod yet, but they haven't. So, um, so this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. One of these days, I'm going to go out and find it, and that will be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. I don't know why people don't like Virginia creeper. It's a beautiful plant and supports lots of beautiful things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult. The lettered Sphinx, the hog Sphinx, the abbot Sphinx, all of these things have come to our Virginia creeper. 
wanted the zebra swallowtail. I was pushing it here because we're at the northern limit of this beautiful swallowtail. It's a pawpaw specialist. And the nearest population that I know of is 26 miles south of us. And I didn't know if they'd ever be able to find it. We planted lots of pawpaws and um, they did find it, but it took nine years. We had to wait for him to get up here and they finally are here. In the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx and lots of pawpaws. One of the double tooth prominent because it's a beautiful caterpillar and it's a specialist on elm. So we planted American elm. It came. One of the evening primrose moth because uh, it's beautiful. Who, I, you know, who wouldn't want that beautiful moth? Planted evening primrose and there it is. Uh, it spends the day hiding in the flowers of the, the evening primrose. Then we planted lots of oaks. Now I want to focus on oaks because they're such important species. Those are just examples of what we put into our, our yard. But now this is the, the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And a lot of people think that you need enormous oaks before they can contribute to your property. I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, unless you die before next year, you will be able to enjoy it, or at least you'll be able to see what it's, what it's bringing to your property. And I can say that with confidence because the oaks I planted were largely acorns or two-foot bare root. Um, whips. And right away they started bringing in uh, the, the caterpillars and the moths that eat the oaks that then support our birds. So things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the orange-headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to our oaks and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has popped up above the leaves, and here's a crocus geometer eating that, that pin oak uh, in its very first year. You don't have to wait years for your oaks to start to contribute. This is a picture of our house from um, a recent picture from the same perspective I took that first one. We've got long, we're very traditional here, but I put uh, many of the plants back, not all of them, still working on it. But right away, I noticed that a lot of moths are coming to our property, so I made it a goal starting four years ago to take a picture of every species of moth at our house still working on it, but I'm up to 1,024 species of moths that I've photographed at our house. Um, again, we live on 10 acres in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres in size. So in one 240 thousandth of the land mass uh, of, of Pennsylvania, we're supporting 40% of all the moths that occur in Pennsylvania. And each one of those species is bird food. And that's probably why we uh, have recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, which is 38% of all the terrestrial bird species in Pennsylvania. A couple of weeks ago, we saw this headline, two thirds of Earth's wildlife have vanished since 1970. All I can say is not at our house. I will wager that in a lot shorter period uh, than that, we have uh, more than increased the biodiversity of our house by two thirds, simply by putting the plants back. This is reversible, folks. This should be good news. But can it work in suburbia? A lot of people don't own 10 acres. Good question. Uh, I went to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. Um, where they have 0.6 acres, so 18 times less land than, than we own, and they're in a typical suburban neighborhood, uh, surrounded by people with lots of big lawns. Uh, they had the, the, the invasive species in Kirkwood, Missouri, the big plant that's causing so much problems is bush honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was get rid of that. Then they planted a lot of native plants and they put in a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to the birds that use their yard. They're up to 149 species of birds, 35 warbler species. <laughs> We've only recorded eight on 0.6 acres. So yes, it works on smaller pieces of land. Can it work in urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's uh, yard in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, she's right next to O'Hare, one of O'Hare Airport's runways, um, right next to Kennedy Expressway. She only has one-tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. <clears throat> Well, she, she um, and there's no connectivity with her yard and any other natural area. She's a little teeny island, but she had took out her invasive species, planted 60 species of native plants, put in a water feature, and then she 
started to count her her uh, birds. She's up to 116 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. What about city centers? Well, 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa. People call it butterfly weed. Um, that reminds me, we have a, a serious marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So we're not going to call it butterfly weed anymore. We're going to call it uh, monarch's delight. So I was staring at, at monarch's delight. And the first thing I saw were two species of megachylid bee, two species of leafcutter bee. I know they're leafcutter bees because they carry their pollen on their tummy and not on their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very specific requirements. Uh, not only do they require pollen and nectar, but they also require soft leaves because they carve the edges of those leaves out, roll them up, stuff them with pollen, put that in a crack, and that's where they, they lay their eggs and reproduce. And red bud leaves are perfect for that. Well, there was a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight, so the bees had everything they needed. And because there was a red bug there, that, of course, blooms very early, and that provides the perfect forage for queen bumblebees when they're struggling to start their colony. They don't have any workers to help them, so they need a lot of good early season forage. And there were bumblebees there. Then I saw a monarch. I actually saw two monarchs. Now, this was 2014. 2013 was the lowest point of the monarch population. 3.6% uh, of the eastern monarch population left. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. So this was exciting to me. And actually, there were, there were two monarchs here. They were there because uh, they had monarch's delight. They also had another species of milkweed, which, of course, this is their host plant, milkweed. And it gave them, uh, it gave them uh, lots of, of nectar as well. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan middle of New York City. This is an elevated railroad that has been converted to a, a tourist destination. And this is the amount of nature we're talking about. It's a, it's a strip of planting. There's the Monarch's Delight. Um, we're 30 feet above the taxis and everything else. I mean, this is not what you picture when you, when you think about a natural area. Um, but it was very productive. And it convinced me that thoughtful native plantings are so powerful, they can bring life back almost anywhere. The High Line's not 100% native, uh, but it's close enough and it really works. But there are four things we need to think about if we want to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we have to shrink the area that's in, in lawn. Now, we, we people in the U.S. probably have more lawn than you guys do in Canada. I don't know. But um, we've got 40 million acres, which is the size of New England. Uh, and it's a status symbol, but it's a deadscape. We can no longer afford to, to allocate that much of the Earth's land surface to, to a status symbol. So I'm suggesting we cut that in half. The, the lawn that we keep will still be manicured, will still be good citizens, but we're going to replant the rest. And if we do that in half the area that's in lawn, we can that'll give us 20 million acres to work with. If we do it at home, we can create a new national park that we call Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badland National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. And of all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. A lot of benefits to, to putting nature back where you live. Um, you, can, you can rebuild a personal relationship with the natural world simply by going outside. You can do it at your own pace, whenever you have time. You can avoid the crowds that come with going to a national park. It's free, no admission uh, charge, no travel hassles. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the road. You get to experience the natural world alone, which is really important, particularly for our kids. You know, Richard Lewis says they're suffering from nature deficit disorder. Um, they need to be able to experience, experience the natural world by themselves, no parental supervision. Let them just go out into your own yard and discover something natural. Maybe they can learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii. And her patch of nature is pretty small. It's about 10 by 10 square feet of, of uh, lawn with a hedge. But there are no lizards there. Uh, and she sent me this picture explaining how you hunt those, those lizards. You get in the ground, you disguise yourself with leaves and sticks so they can't see you coming, and then you crawl very slowly along the ground. Um, no smiling. This is serious stuff. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizards, you catch them, and there's your personal experience. I don't think Zoe's going to be doing this the rest of her life, but I do, I am sure she will remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. 
All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put back into that area? At least some of them have to be what I call keystone plants. Um, this is one of the most important things we discovered in, in my lab in, in recent years, and that is that all native plants are not equal in what they contribute to local food webs. Only about 5% of them are making about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food which means 85% of our native plants aren't doing all that much. So the question no longer is simply are natives better than non-natives. On average, they certainly are. Uh, but it's really, do we want ecologically productive plants in our yard or benign plants or ecologically destructive plants? Any of those ornamentals from Asia that uh, are not contributing to food webs, but then just escape and become serious invasive species in our natural layers that become biological pollution and that's that's the trade-off. I get an email once or twice a year from from uh, somebody who says, "Don't I know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba, actually grew? That's an Asian plant, but they actually grew in North America seven million years ago. That makes them native." Well, yes, I did know that they grew here seven million years ago, um, but this is not our metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not. I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon seven million years ago. They produce zero species of caterpillars. No bird is going to live off of a, of a ginkgo. What are they going to live off? Well, uh, and at least in North America and certainly in Southern Canada, oaks are the most important species you can put in your landscape. 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic states and over 900 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that in terms of productivity. Now, as you move farther up into Canada, you're going to get into your conifers that are, are taking over the job, but they're still not as, as uh, supportive as, as oaks. Um, how do we in the U.S. find out what our keystone species are? We go to Native Plant Finder, National Wildlife Federation website, and put in our zip code and the ranked list of woody and herbaceous plants um, for our county pop-up. Um, people who live in Toronto or, or, or close to the U.S. can put in a zip code of any of the states just south of you and you come up with a very productive list. It's much longer than this. I stopped because I ran out of, out of room. Um, but that's, that's how we do it. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. It's going to attract a lot of insects, particularly moths to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security lights. And that, of course, is not the goal. Uh, a lot of research, particularly from Europe, is suggesting that, that, that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines uh, worldwide. Um, we don't know why insects go to lights, but we do know how lights kill them. They kill them by exhaustion. Those moths fly around and around and around until they, till they die. They collide with the light and, and uh, get killed. They get incinerated. They die of dehydration. The bat comes and picks them off. Uh, turns out that a lot of nocturnal insects get blinded by lights. Who knew? And it, it wrecks, you know, their daily daily jobs of finding a mate and, and reproducing. To me, this is actually good news because here, if we've identified one of the major causes of insect declines, we know how to fix it, and it's easy. You turn your lights off. But I know what you're going to say. You can't turn your lights off because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. The first thing you're going to discover is a bad man doesn't come very often. If you don't want to do that, take the white light out of your security bulb, light mercury vapor lamps are the worst, and replace it with a yellow bulb. Um, yellow, yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to insects than our white wavelengths, and yellow LED lights are the least attractive. We could save billions of insects almost overnight by replacing our night lights with yellow LED lights, and we'd save a lot of energy as well. Fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the, the oak tree. They eat the leaves, they spin a cocoon, hang from the branch, then they emerge as an adult, and they do it all over again. But most of the things that eat oaks, um, 480 species, 94% drop from the tree and wiggle their way underground to, to pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree. The problem, of course, is that we don't landscape in a way that they can do that. There is no leaf litter under the tree, and we mow and compact our soil to the point where it's too hard for the caterpillar to wiggle underground. So this becomes an ecological trap. We're calling in the moths. The, they lay their eggs. The caterpillars develop, and they drop down, and they die. 
I am convinced this is another major cause of insect declines. And the the um, the typical cement landscape of a of a city is even uh, less of a viable option. This is what people usually do. You put a tree in a, a big lawn. Nobody's measured how well caterpillars survive in a situation like this, but I guarantee they survive better in a situation like this, where you have a tree and you have a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood here, a native azalea, uh, ferns and, and ground covers. The moth drives, the caterpillar drops down into a safe site. It can get underground because the soil is loose. It can spin its cocoon. Nobody's gonna step on it or mow it. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You build big beds around your trees, and that takes area out of lawn. It also creates those safe sites for the caterpillars to, to pupate in. This is where you can use your, your ground covers, like wild ginger or mayapple or foam flower or, or native pachysandra. They're all safe sites. Another one of my grad students, Desiree uh, Narango, has, has uh, her research has shown that there is room for compromise in our plant choices, and that's good news. She studied chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., where she compared chickadee reproduction in landscapes that were dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by introduced ornamentals. When they were dominated by introduced orna ornamentals, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, there was 75% less bird food available for the chickadees. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Now, there were nest boxes up in all of the, the study plots that she had, but chickadees would come and look around and say, there's simply not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. They produced 1.2 fewer fledglings if they did survive, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. You might say, well, that, those aren't huge differences, but when you put all that together in a population growth model, this is what you get. As a function of the percentage of non-native plant woody biomass in your yard, from none to 100%. This dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies uh, in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you, if you make the same amount of babies, you're at that dotted line, and that's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population, but if you make fewer babies, you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap, right around 30% non-native woody plant biomass. So as soon as you exceed that in non-native plant biomass, then you are in this, this declining, unsustainable uh, population right here. This is where they overlap, and this is the area of, of compromise. Uh, so you can have, uh, you can have your, your boxwood, you can have your, your, um, your forsythia, you can have any of the, the non-native plants that are not invasive in your yard without destroying bird reproduction, as long as it's less than 30% than of the uh, woody plant biomass in your yard. If you exceed that, that then it's not going to work. But this, this is the area for compromise. Uh, we love our non-natives. If I, my message was you couldn't have any uh, non-native plants in your yard. Very few people would be listening to me. So this, this part is good news. Um, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one is we've assumed that nature is important. We like it. We want it to be around, but it's not essential. And that means uh, whenever push comes to shove, which is always, um, nature loses. Nature loses. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there was this wall-sized poster that, to me, epitomizes the, our society's view of, of conservation. We want to save wildlife so that future generations can enjoy it. And we understand that. And, you know, that, that's important. But the, to me, that suggests nature's there just for entertainment. And it's far more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. Uh, second uh, misstep is that we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now, I talked about this. If we restrict conservation just to untouched areas where we have relatively few humans, we've condemned it to failure because those areas are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species we need them to sustain. David Quammen has an excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. 
The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests that there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the Earth has ecological significance, even our yards. So what we need to do is we need to put the plants back in all of those places where we've taken them out and reconnect. We've got to glue our rug back together again. We've got to favor those keystone plants that are so powerful. We're not just making biological carters here that allow plants and animals to move back and forth. We're making such rich areas that they can actually live in what is now no man's zone. That means we're going to share our human spaces with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to a few specialists, few ecologists, few conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't we all bear responsibility for good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You know, we're not born with these mindsets. We're taught them. And we've been good at teaching this one. I have rights. We've been terrible at teaching uh, the, the obligations that each one of us has to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean that you have to save biodiversity for a living, although it's a good living. But you can save it where you live. And I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. You know, today, so many of us feel powerless. The Earth's problems are so huge that we, we feel that one person can't, can't do anything. But, you know, go out, go outside, plant that oak, plant that powerhouse plant wherever you live and watch the life come to it. One person did that. You can shrink your lawn. You can put in your pollinator garden. You can, you can remove your invasive species. Do all the things that turn your yard into a conservation zone. And you can do it alone. You're part, you're, you are an important cog in the wheel of future conservation. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet's problem. Just worry about you, the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, that's it. And if everybody who owned property... Uh, restored their property we'd be we'd be mostly done if you don't own property if you live in a city or, or just don't own property help somebody who does volunteer volunteer for a land conservancy um, or a, a clear uh, nearby park or preserve they all are underfunded understaffed they need your help so as property owners or as volunteers each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and ultimately our own fate. So I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Oh, nice job, Moira. That's an excellent presentation. Now we have to, ho ho, way to go. Getting clever. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much for that. Now, now the next question, Moira, is uh, are you available to take questions? Uh, well, <laughs> I have no idea. No, you're joking. Yes. <laughs> um, well, only because we don't have Dr. Talami available to us. Yeah, exactly. um, but uh, that, that was great. And uh, one of the things that kind of tells you it's great is we didn't lose anybody. So everyone stayed for the, uh, the whole length. Um, the other thing I enjoyed there, I saw uh, quite a bit of uh, chats um, that pop up. And uh, so I, I enjoy going back to the chats in this case to see what people are saying. And we definitely have some um, uh, members that are very much into the environment and uh, quite happy that Rotary now environment is one of our areas of focus. As well, you know, we're so proud of our Rotary Eco Trail and, and hopefully we'll be able to do something coming up to help improve that as well. So I uh, wasn't sure whether any other questions that anybody wanted to throw out and we'll see if anybody can answer them or uh, Barry always. Yes. I'm just going to make a reality, take a reality check. Uh, so Peter, uh, you're uh, recording this and this, so this is going to be available to move around. Yes, uh, Peter was recording. Allison? Maybe um, Chandra could explain what she mentioned in the chat about the new CK Butterfly Way. And also, welcome, Chandra. Nice to have you in our club. Great to see you. 
we're already Thanks, a Allison. Um, founder up to be a part of environment so <laughs> we'll yes definitely sign me up for all the green stuff <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I mentioned in the chat that there is a local group on Facebook. Um, you can click the link on there. This year I am uh, what they call a butterfly way ranger. Uh, it doesn't come with an official hat, unfortunately, but uh, um, I'm a ranger to bring um, butterflies and moths back to Chatham Kent. And it's a free group to join. And what our goal is, is to help people learn what plants to plant locally. Um, even if you can just do a few containers on your balcony or whether you can replace a few plants in your garden mm -hmm. uh, and to start getting butterfly and moth patches when everybody's uh, backyard or, or a rural space or something like that. So please feel free to join the group. Uh, we're really friendly and uh, we're just getting started this year. So I'm looking forward to seeing lots of butterfly patches uh, here in Chatham, Kent. Sandra, is this what you're talking about? Yep, that's definitely one of them. That looks like, uh, I can't see it too clear. It looks like it might be swamp milkweed, Barry? Uh, common milkweed, it said, says. Common milkweed, okay, yep, great, it's perfect. Okay. Just a little question from the, uh, the ignorant side here. Uh, has anyone taken a good comparison to the allergies, the negative effects, the quality of life side that can be deteriorated by excessive uh, involvement of too many insects and too many birds and trying to get outside. Not trying to be a wise guy, but is there a balance somewhere? Any thoughts, anybody? I, I know as, as one of those people that suffer a bit with a, a few allergies that uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things that um, shouldn't be around, but uh, at the same time, it's uh, love to see, I mean, what the doctor showed us as far as the number of um, uh, caterpillars and things, I, I had no idea. And, and I appreciated the um, uh, program because he was going through like so many of them so fast. I mean, there's just so many that, that are out there, but uh, when you talk about uh, going and doing plantings, like, like Tom was talking, you know, what's that going to do to some of the allergies? So uh, I just load up on reactant and keep on going. Uh, Tanya, you had something to share? Yes, I just wanted to mention that um, Chatham Ken Public Library will be distributing um, seeds again this year through the Seed Library. And um, a new venture is they will be distributing the milkweed, butterfly, those milkweed seeds in the fall, because apparently that's the best time to um, plant. So it's a good thing. <laughs> oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna trust you on that. Uh, Allison, you had your hand up and then Rick. I was just going to say, Tom McCarthy, I totally appreciate your point because I come from a family of allergy sufferers and my nose basically runs 12 months a year now. So I feel like I feel like adding these probably more native plants might might not make it any worse than it already is. And then we actually create biodiversity. So if I'm going to continue sniffling anyway, I might as well keep sniffling with the right plants <laughs> causing it than, <laughs> than something else. But I, I appreciate your, your perspective as a fellow allergy family. Okay, I'm going to go to Rick and then Chandra. Uh, <clears throat> Rotary Park on the Thames is uh, a tiny, one of the tiny, tinier areas that you described. But uh, besides that, that might be a candidate to replace some of the drafts area with uh, uh, the ecological uh, the caterpillar uh, plants. A bit more native, yes. Good idea, Rick. Uh, Chandra and then Jennifer. Sure, I just wanted to chime in on the allergy front. I too suffer from allergies pretty extensively. Um, one of the things though that I've actually found that it's the synthetic fragrances that we get in our detergents and our soaps and everything else like that that I tend to be allergic to more so than the natural stuff. So uh, that might be something for, for people who suffer from the allergies to consider eliminating before we, uh, before we worry too much about the plants. 
Um, the other thing I'll mention too is that goldenrod often gets a bad rap for, um, you know, the cause of a lot of allergies. It's actually ragweed that does that. So feel free to plant uh, goldenrod and, and uh, not worry about it too much. Uh, Jennifer, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, if you can, can you read that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so this is a book, uh, we got the Weimarsh um, of, about butterflies in, the, in your garden and it's fabulous. It's got uh, all, of, all of the things that, that you can grow and what to grow them on for their categories. Very good. Uh, Barry? What Barry, you're on mute. Still on mute. Don't tell them. <laughs> there, I found it. Back to you, uh, Rick, and over to you, Chandra. Uh, the first place that we could start uh, is uh, planting around the cairn at the Rotary Park up by the river. Uh, there's growing nothing there, and uh, that'll be a, a quick win. I, I think we should uh, start moving in that direction quick. Yeah. Uh, Tom Story. Yeah, I, I know Jennifer is looking for um, for uh, presenters at our noon hour meeting. It sounded to me like Chandra just volunteered uh, regarding uh, the butterfly uh, uh, thing. So uh, uh, I would ask Chandra to, to be a, she's a program on that and follow up on what we heard today, which I thought was outstanding. I was she's very... booked. Oh, never mind then. <laughs> no, but you're right. It's a good thought to uh, just uh, thank goodness we're, we were on there because I, I think there's uh, be a qualification talk as well as uh, other information we hope. Yeah, well, Chandra's spoken at our club before. It's been a while since we heard from her and, and that talk was very fascinating. I can still remember it quite clearly, but I'd like her to shift gears. I'd um, like to hear about both. Maybe she can do two. Uh, um, Maybe I should shut up before she decides to leave the club. But uh, <laughs> late, just, we watch me run the other way now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to speak on that and uh, good memory for remembering because that was a few years back, Tom. Yeah, it was, but it was it was memorable. It was great to see uh, your uh, remarkable entrepreneurship um, and with Scribendi, and I that has uh, you know as a local success story for sure and. Um, we need more of those, but hearing from you was, was certainly memorable that day, so. I'm glad to be reminded that Tom has got a good memory. It's selective, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, any other comments to pop in there? I have to be careful when I open that up sometimes. <laughs> I wouldn't mind, um, Brett, I wouldn't mind seeing now Moira, I don't know if it's easy and you don't have to do it right now, but maybe you could send me or the club the link. There was a link in the presentation of where there's a website to find all those non or native plants. One of the last few slides. Do you know which one I mean? Maybe we could get that link to. Yeah, okay. you send that link to me, if you, if you send, if you send yeah. that link to me. And if you have a direct link to the uh, presentation itself, then I can include that in the uh, YouTube version of the recording. Perfect. Perfect. That'd be it's great. a long link. That's okay. That's okay. You just cut and paste. It will work. Yeah. Thank you. Because I'd like to see that too. Um, so our speaker next week will be uh, Stuart McFadden from uh, Chatham-Kent Economic Development. And I think the talk is about uh, growth and new development uh, during COVID. So uh, interesting to see how Chatham-Kent is doing and uh, hearing from the municipality. So uh, we'll tune in for that. And uh, if that's everything, uh, Julia, if you're, yes, you're still here with us. If you, oh, wait a minute, uh, Rick Benerick, you got something else, please? Well, I just wanted to say, I see you're brought, you're uh, in the office. I was wondering if you've moved uh, 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 sleeping accommodations uh, in there for yourself. <laughs> Not yet, but I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Julia, if you would.
ചോദിച്ചു Thank you, Julia. And uh, just a reminder, uh, with regard to the 100th anniversary committee, I'll be sending out a link uh, this afternoon for a meeting at seven o'clock and we'll see who's available to uh, meet up with us at that time. And um, Moira, thank you very much. I think uh, everyone enjoyed it. And uh, looking at my numbers, I think we had some of the best attendance uh, that we've had in some time. So wonderful, thank you. Uh, Brett? This wild thing, uh, when I was unmuted, I want to apologize for that shrinking, shrieking in the background, my wife's playing bridge. Is she winning? Oh, she just reminded me she's not shrieking. Okay, never mind. <laughs>